how long Mexican American families had been in the United States, they were often seen as foreigners in their own land. One of eight children, Idar grew up in an educated middle-class family with a strong sense of social justice. Her father was egalitarian in terms of women's rights. He believed that women had a right to have a political voice, and he was very proud of Jovita Idar, proud of all of her knowledge, all of her education, and her daring. After attending Methodist schools, Idar became a teacher in 1903. Ethnic Mexican children had no choice but to attend these schools that were second rate in every way. The buildings were falling apart, they didn't have school supplies, and the history that they were learning taught them Mexicans were the bad guys, and Davy Crockett and other Anglo-Americans were the good guys. Jovita Ida quickly grew frustrated with the lack of resources and support. Mexican children in Texas need an education. But if they are taught the biography of Washington, but not Hidalgo, the exploits of Lincoln, but not Juarez, that child will be indifferent to his heritage. She believed that she would have better luck helping La Raza, Mexican-American and Mexican immigrant people elsewhere. And that's when she decided to join her father and her siblings in human and civil rights activism through journalism. Idar became a reporter for the family's weekly Spanish-language newspaper, La Cronica. She used the pseudonym in order to not be criticized for participating in what was considered to be unladylike critiques of the political culture in Texas at the time. The focus of Jovita's reporting was racism, segregation, poverty, being bilingual, anti-Mexican hate women, access to democratic institutions. It's like she could have been alive today. My name is Maria Hinojosa, and I'm the anchor and executive producer of Latino USA and of In the Thick. I was the first ever Latina hired at NPR in 1985 in the newsroom. Then I was the first Latina correspondent hired at CNN and at PBS. Right now, I'm one of the few Latinas running a nonprofit independent newsroom in the United States. The number of Latinas in America's newsrooms is still very small. Just over 2% in newspapers, about 4% in radio, and about 8% in television news. So journalism has been one of the slowest institutions to change and diversify and have real inclusion and equity. In the early 20th century, we have essentially the creation of Jaime Pro or Juan Pro, which is the Mexican-American equivalent of Jim Pro. Signs that stated, no Mexicans or dogs allowed were everywhere. Less known is the unfortunate reality that ethnic Mexican men were also lynched. Some people were burned alive, dragged across town, really horrific ways of killing people, mutilating their bodies to intimidate ethnic Mexican people so that they would not vote, so that they would not complain. In 1911, following the brutal lynching of a 14-year-old boy in Thorndale, Texas, Idar and her family organized a conference that kick-started the modern Mexican-American civil rights movement. The first Mexicanist Congress El Primer Congreso Mexicanista lasted several days, and it was basically a human rights congress that attracted leaders from the United States and Mexico who wanted an end to the discrimination and the lynchings. Shortly after the Congress, Idar founded the League of Mexican Women and became its first president. The organization's main causes were women's suffrage and quality education for Tejano children. We want our work to be significant, contributing to the formation of character and the cultivation of the minds of future generations. She was in favor of women's rights to vote and to participate in the economy. One of the most significant roles that Jovita had was to invite ethnic Mexican women to participate. 
at a time when many Mexican American and Mexican immigrant women would have found it challenging to step into a public role, to be a part of the women's liberation process. The Mexican Revolution began in 1910 and spread to Texas border regions by 1914. La Cronica ceased publication and Idar joined a nursing unit for the Revolutionary Army. La Cruz Blanca, the White Cross founded by her best friend, Leonor Villegas de Magnon, and they're in the middle of battles trying to save men, bandaging up, sending them back into the battlefield, all in the name of bringing democracy to Mexico. When the mutilated bodies of the soldiers were brought to my door, my heart jumped in volcanic upheaval. And from that moment, I felt that the fate and duties of my life had transformed. After her service in the White Cross, Idar returned to journalism, writing for various Spanish language newspapers and creating her own in 1916, titled Evolución. I bought a press worth more than $1,000 and plenty of type. I can make a seven column newspaper and we'll start soon. Her legacy is teaching us to be fearless. Being a Latina journalist in the United States of America means that the way you approach journalism is gonna be different and distinct from other journalists. We actually have played a central role in the narrative of this country. We don't get a lot of play. We're not running the big newspapers of record, but our voices and our perspectives really matter. Jovita Idar handed over the operation of Evolucion to her brother Eduardo when she and her husband moved to San Antonio in 1921. There, Idar helped undocumented workers obtain naturalization papers after the Border Patrol was created in 1924. She also founded a free nursery school and tutored young children. She died in 1946 at age 60. She used her voice to encourage women to be politically involved within the American system, to be proactive, to join organizations, to seek an education, to craft a better future for their children. And she devoted her entire life to that project. Women recognized their rights, proudly raised their chins, and faced the struggle. The times of humiliation have passed. Women are no longer men's servants, but their equals, their partners. Subscribe for more amazing stories of unsung, unladylike women every Wednesday. Just hit the subscribe button in the window. Who inspires change? Jovita Idar. As a fierce advocate for equality, Idar was on the front lines of Mexican-American civil rights. Her journalism exposed injustice, and she encouraged women to be involved in public policy. This Mexican-American activist and journalist believed that education was the foundation of freedom. Discover and share her story with the American Women Quarters Collection. She saw no conflict between being a journalist and an educator and a feminist. She was always on the front lines of change. In 1914, Laredo, Texas, 29-year-old journalist Jovita Idar worked for the Spanish-language newspaper El Progreso when it published an editorial criticizing U.S. military intervention in the Mexican Revolution. And for that, the Texas governor ordered the Texas Rangers to destroy El Progreso. 
They were a police force meant to protect the Anglo-Texan economic and political elites who would shoot first and ask questions later. But when they arrived, they found Jovita Idar standing proudly there, and she was not about to let them infringe upon their First Amendment rights as a free press. The Rangers said, please step aside. And I said, no, I'm standing here, and you cannot come in because it's against the law. A Mexican-American, Spanish-speaking, bilingual brown woman stood up to the Texas Rangers at a time when they were committing terrible crimes against people of color and specifically ethnic Mexicans. Idar stood her ground and the Rangers left. But as her brother, Aquilino, later described, they returned early the next morning. They had hammers and uh, hammers, and they broke the press. They wrecked everything. Jovita Idar was born in Laredo in 1885, 40 years after Texas became a state. This territory that becomes the U.S. Southwest was actually part of Mexico. And you have the U.S.-Mexico War in the 1840s, which Mexico loses, and they have to give up about half of their sovereign territory to the United States territory we now know as Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and parts of Colorado and Wyoming. So Texas, or Texas, was part of that Spanish-Mexican world. But regardless of how long Mexican-American families had been in the United States, they were often seen as foreigners in their own land. One of eight children, Idar grew up in an educated middle-class family with a strong sense of social justice. Her father was egalitarian in terms of women's rights. He believed that women had a right to have a political voice, and he was very proud of Fobita Idar, proud of all of her knowledge, all of her education, and her daring. After attending Methodist schools, Idar became a teacher in 1903. Ethnic Mexican children had no choice but to attend these schools that were second rate in every way. The buildings were falling apart, they didn't have school supplies, and the history that they were learning taught them Mexicans were the bad guys, and Davy Crockett and other Anglo-Americans were the good guys. Jovita Ida quickly grew frustrated with the lack of resources and support. Mexican children in Texas need an education. But if they are taught the biography of Washington, but not Hidalgo, the exploits of Lincoln, but not Juarez, that child will be indifferent to his heritage. She believed that she would have better luck helping La Raza, Mexican-American and Mexican immigrant people elsewhere. And that's when she decided to join her father and her siblings in human and civil rights activism through journalism. Idar became a reporter for the family's weekly Spanish-language newspaper, La Cronica. She used the pseudonym in order to not be criticized for participating in what was considered to be unladylike critiques of the political culture in Texas at the time. The focus of Jovita's reporting was racism, segregation, poverty, being bilingual, anti-Mexican hate women, access to democratic institutions. It's like she could have been alive today. My name is Maria Hinojosa, and I'm the anchor and executive producer of Latino USA and of In the Thick. I was the first ever Latina hired at NPR in 1985 in the newsroom. Then I was the first Latina correspondent hired at CNN and at PBS. Right now, I'm one of the few Latinas running a nonprofit independent newsroom in the United States. The number of Latinas in America's newsrooms is still very small. Just over 2% in newspapers, about 4% in 
in radio and about 8% in television news. So journalism has been one of the slowest institutions to change and diversify and have real inclusion and equity. In the early 20th century, we have essentially the creation of Jaime Pro or Juan Pro, which is the Mexican-American equivalent of Jim Pro. Signs that stated, no Mexicans or dogs allowed were everywhere. Less known is the unfortunate reality that ethnic Mexican men were also lynched. Some people were burned alive, dragged, across town. Really horrific ways of killing people, mutilating their bodies to intimidate ethnic Mexican people so that they would not vote, so that they would not complain. In 1911, following the brutal lynching of a 14-year-old boy in Thorndale, Texas, Idar and her family organized a conference that kick-started the modern Mexican-American civil rights movement. The first Mexicanist Congress El Primer Congreso Mexicanista lasted several days, and it was basically a human rights congress that attracted leaders from the United States and Mexico who wanted an end to the discrimination and the lynchings. Shortly after the Congress, Idar founded the League of Mexican Women and became its first president. The organization's main causes were women's suffrage and quality education for Tejano children. We want our work to be significant, contributing to the formation of character and the cultivation of the minds of future generations. She was in favor of women's rights to vote and to participate in the economy. One of the most significant roles that Fovita had was to invite ethnic Mexican women to participate. At a time when many Mexican-American and Mexican immigrant women would have found it challenging to step into a public role, to be a part of the women's liberation process. The Mexican Revolution began in 1910 and spread to Texas border regions by 1914. La Cronica ceased publication and Idar joined a nursing unit for the Revolutionary Army. La Cruz Blanca the White Cross founded by her best friend, Leonor Villegas de Magnon. And they're in the middle of battles trying to save men, bandaging up, sending them back into the battlefield, all in the name of bringing democracy to Mexico. When the mutilated bodies of the soldiers were brought to my door, my heart jumped in volcanic upheaval. And from that moment, I felt that the fate and duties of my life had transformed. After her service in the White Cross, Idar returned to journalism, writing for various Spanish-language newspapers and creating her own in 1916, titled Evolución. I bought a press worth more than $1,000 and plenty of type. I can make a seven-column newspaper, and we'll start soon. Her legacy is teaching us to be fearless. Being a Latina journalist in the United States of America means that the way you approach journalism is going to be different and distinct from other journalists. We actually have played a central role in the narrative of this country. We don't get a lot of play. We're not running the big newspapers of record, but our voices and our perspectives really matter. Jovita Idar handed over the operation of Evolución to her brother Eduardo when she and her husband moved to San Antonio in 1921. There, Idar helped undocumented workers obtain naturalization papers after the Border Patrol was created in 1924. She also founded a free nursery school and tutored young children. She died in 1946 at age 60. She used her voice to encourage women to be politically involved within the American system, to be proactive, to join organizations, to seek an education, to craft a better future for their children. And she devoted her entire life to that project. Women recognized their rights, proudly raised their chins, and faced the struggle. The times of humiliation have passed. Women are no longer men's servants but they're equals, they're partners.
Good evening. How is everybody? This is a this is a very very special moment, and to have this room be packed and the room next door be packed says a lot about how important this event is. Welcome to the Buena Vista Theater at the University of Texas at San Antonio's downtown campus. I'm Taylor Amy, and I proudly serve and am honored to be the president of this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful institution. And today is a, a day, thank you, we have a great institution. And today is one of the reasons why I love my job. As I said, tonight is a very special occasion honoring the life, legacy, and impact of a remarkable journalist, activist, teacher, and suffragist Jovita Idar. Jovita devoted her life to fighting for equality and creating pathways of success for all individuals, regardless of their background. And her work continues today to positively impact Mexican American communities across the country. And I want to add a, a thought here that at her time of, of growing up and bringing her activists passion to really, really important causes, it was very perilous to be such an activist. And the fact that she did that also speaks to her courage. For these reasons and more, we're honored to host this evening's quarter release. How many of you have ever been to a quarter release before? <laughs> this is a first, right? It's pretty cool. And it's obviously an important one because we're going to commemorate Jovita's legacy. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few shout outs of thanks. First of all, I have an amazing team of people that I get to work with. And all of my colleagues that brought this event to life, would you stand and be recognized? They're here somewhere. They might be behind the scenes, but let's give them a big shout out. Thank you to our presenting partners United States Mint and the National Women's History Museum. If you're with the Mint or the Women's History Museum, please stand and be recognized. I mean, not only is it pretty cool to be at the unveiling of an official new special quarter, but how many of you have had a chance to hang out with people from the US Mint? <laughs> That's special too. Next week, Fort Knox. And finally, I want to say thank you to the Idar family for allowing us to share this special occasion with you. If you're a member of the Idar family, would you stand and be recognized? Wow, look at that. What a familia. Very special. We are so proud of you. And I also want to give a special thanks to our very own UTSA resident expert on Jovita Idar, Associate Professor of History, Dr. Gabriela Gonzalez. Gabriela, are you here? You know, I, 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 I really wanted to give her a shout out because we have amazing faculty. And I had a chance to catch up with her next door at the end of the panel session. I was saying, hey, it's not great to see you. And she said, President Amy, we've met before, and I went, oh, darn. <laughs> so having met her now twice, I will remember. Right? As many of you here know, Jovita was a powerful force with ideas far ahead of her time. She believed education was the foundation for a better future and fought tirelessly to bring equal opportunities for all. At her core, Jovita was an educator, although she later worked as a journalist, a political activist, a nurse, and a creator of one of the first known Latina feminist organizations, the League of Mexican Women. And she did all that while never losing her sight about the importance of education. Jovita taught with her actions and served on the front lines of change for the rights of women and Mexican Americans. She led an admirable life Idar family is, is a good indicator of that. 
And uh, she always was on this notion uh, that education was key to creating real change and opportunity. Now, it won't surprise you when I say this, at UTSA, we have a very similar belief, a belief that education is the greatest equalizer of all. In fact, our institution was founded here in San Antonio to advance the education of Mexican Americans and, under, uh, under, and other underserved communities, and we continue to take immense pride in all our efforts to create opportunities for all. As a university of the future and the city of the future, we strive to ensure our de demographics mirror the communities that we serve. We're also keenly invested in the success of all of our students, creating opportunities across campuses where all individuals feel welcome, heard, empowered, and ready to go out and change the world and make it a better place. As, you, as, you, as UTSA continues on its rap, rapid upward trajectory, we're committed to never losing sight of who we are as a Hispanic serving institution and the community that we serve. As one of only 21 other institutions nationwide that are both Carnegie R1 and Hispanic serving, we are deeply, deeply invested in continuing to create knowledge, create opportunities, and benefit for all. I am immensely inspired by the impact that Jovita has made on the Mexican American community here across our country and globally. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to celebrate her life's work alongside each of you here this evening. Let's continue celebrating her legacy beyond this evening. She so deserves it. Let's also continue shaping the future based on her belief that education can truly change everything. Now to continue our program, it's my honor to introduce our next speaker United States Mint Deputy Director, Christine McNally. Please welcome her. Okay, I'm a little on the shorter side, so I think I'm better now. Okay, thank you, Dr. Amy. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you all in celebrating the release of the Hodita, Hovita Adar Quarter. How fitting that we're in San Antonio, where this amazing woman spent a third of her life supporting a community that she loved. I would like to thank the University of Texas at San Antonio for hosting us, as well as the Hovita Adara State and the National Women's History Museum for working with the Mint on this very special event. Recognizing and honoring women on our nation's coinage is vital because our coins tell the American story, reflecting who we are and what matters most to us. For the first time in history, the United States Mint is issuing circulating quarters through a coin program that's solely dedicated to honoring the achievements of American women. Five different designs annually through 2025. This diverse group of women honored through the American Women Quarters Program reflect a wide range of accomplishments and fields. The honorees have shaped our nation's history and helped pave the way for generations that followed. At the Mint, we see the work we do as connecting America through coins. It's our distinct pleasure to connect Americans to Jovita Adar, Mexican American journalist, activist, teacher, and suffragist. She devoted her life to fighting against separatist ideologies and sought to create a better future for Mexican Americans. It was here in San Antonio that Jovita Adar became a political leader in the community, helped establish a free kindergarten, served as a Spanish translator at the county hospital, taught hygiene and childcare classes to women, and worked on a publication called El Herald Cristiano. Who better to honor on the eve of Hispanic Heritage Month than the woman who advocated for the preservation of Hispanic heritage through education and social services. The coins that the Mint produces are actually miniature pieces of arts. Our talented pool of artists continually amaze in how they express the values, 
aspirations, and shared heritage of a nation, all on a canvas the size of a quarter. The ninth coin in the American Women Quarters Program honors the life and legacy of Hodita, Hovita Adar. Designed and sculpted by United States Mint modelic artist John McGraw, the reverse, or tail as you know it, features a description of Hovita Adar with her hands clasped. Within her body are inscriptions representing some of her greatest accomplishments and the newspapers for which she wrote. Inscriptions on the coin include Mexican American rights, teacher, Hovita Adar, nurse, Evolution, Astria, El Gerardo Cristiano, La Cruz Blanca, journalist, La Cronica, El Progreso, La Liga Femenel Mexicanista, Quarter Dollar, E Pluribus Unum, and the United States of America. Unifying the entire COIN program, Unifying the entire coin program is a new obverse designed by one of the most iconic female sculptors of the early 20th century, Laura Garden Frazier. These pioneering women of the American Women Quarters program represent vastly different fields of endeavor, talents, skills, and yet they all share a significant commonality. Their contributions were groundbreaking and had a lasting impact on society and none of them ever settled or accepted the status quo. All of our honorees influenced others and paved the way for each new generation. We hope their stories inspire you and connect you to the history that we all share. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Maria Hinojosa. Ina Hosa's nearly 30-year career as an award-winning journalist includes reporting for PBS, CBS, WNBC, CNN, NPR, and anchoring the Emmy Award-winning talk show from WGBH, Maria Inosa, One on One. She is the author of two books and has won dozens of awards, including four Emmys, the John Chancellor Award, the Studs Terkel Community Media Award, two Robert F. Kennedy Awards, the Edward H. R. Moreau Award for the Overseas Press Club, and the Ruben Salazar Lifetime Achievement Award from the NAHJ. She's even been honored with her own day in October in New York City, and has been recognized by people in Espanol as one of the 25 most powerful Latina women. As a reporter who is the first Latina in many newsrooms, Maria Inojosa dreamt of space where she could create independent multimedia journalism that explores and gives a critical voice to diverse American experience. She made that dream a reality in 2010 when she created Futuro Media an independent nonprofit newsroom based in Harlem with a mission to create multimedia content from a POC perspective. At Futuro Media, Ina Hosa continues to bring attention to experiences and points of view that are often overlooked or underreported in mainstream media, all while mentoring the next generation of diverse journalists to delve into authentic and nuanced stories. Welcome, Ms. Ina Hosa. What's up? What's up, what's up, what's up? San Antonio! Jovita! Oh my God. It's like we've been in a pandemic or something like that. It's so great to be back in San Antonio. Um, it's just so great to be here in San Antonio. And I'm going to talk about San Antonio for a little bit <clears throat> before I talk about Jovita and I would love some water. 
Yo, I've been up since early this morning to get here, um, but it's just great to be here with all of you. So, um, ay, gracias. Yo también los adoro. Don't make me start crying because you know I will. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, like I, you don't know how much I love San Antonio. San Antonio has a very special place in my heart. Um, and so today I was like, let me start thinking about all the things that I've done in San Antonio, right? Um, <clears throat> and the first thing I remember is actually coming here in 1986 to meet Valerio Longoria and to put Conjunto Music uh, nationally on NPR, which I think is pretty crazy. That was like, and we were dancing Conjunto here in San Antonio, like wherever it was that we would dance San Antonio in here in Conjunto Music. Um, you know, and then I was like visiting Sandra Cisneros in the 1990s, going to Mi Tierra with my son and my husband. I was there today, bought more t-shirts. You know, hanging out with Rolando Briseño and Angel Rodriguez, may he rest in peace, and John Santos. Just like so much, like doing a live Latino USA here um, with the public radio and public television stations in 2006, which were when all of the immigrant rights protests were happening and we came here to document and do a live show on Cinco de Mayo. Um, and then think, gracias. And then being here um, in 2010 with the then mayor and meeting Rosie Castro. And you know, and now I'm back here with you today for this extraordinary honor. Um, you know, and, and I was like, it's getting, what? Because I have a lot going on, you know, and so I'm just like, wait, I'm going to San... Wait, there's going to be a Jovita Idar quarter. Wait, and I'm actually going to San Antonio? This is incredible. And so, um, you know, I come back to San Antonio, and today, you know where I was at Mi Tierra, buying more T-shirts and eating with Caitlin's mom. And some of you know who Caitlin's mom is, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But for those of you, if you know, you know, but you'll all know in a minute. So I'm here in San Antonio making another kind of connection to, to our history and our roots in this part of the country. But we are here to honor a powerful, determined, uncensored, feminist, feminista, mexicana, americana, tejana, pues diremos una mera, 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 mera chingona, yeah. who... <laughs> who owned her voice and owned her power, and yet, Cassia, she gave back all the time. It was like this profound sense of civic duty, responsabilidad, understanding this thing that when we have privilege, because those of us who are here in this room, we have privilege. No quiere decir de que la vida es fácil and we don't have problems of every single type, but if we are here right now, able to be here, we have privilege. And so Jovita understood her privilege. And in that grew this profound sense of giving back all the time. But as I was writing my speech, I was like, lo que pasa es de que Jovita Idar vive en nosotras. Ella vive en nosotras. No es la única. Es excepcional. Pero Jovita Idar is not the only one of us. And we know that. And so all of the women who are here, you are all carrying in one form or another la sangre de Jovita y that you have been touched. And we have to own that. And of course, me as a journalist, I'm like, girl, well, I'll tell you what she means to me in a second. But the truth is, is that I'm ashamed, but I'm not surprised that I didn't know about Jovita until the documentary that you were watching was produced by my colleagues through my company, Futuro Media, produce, helped to produce the unladylike television series on PBS. And so my very best friend in the world, her name is Sandy Ratley, an executive producer, a black woman who is a journalist, a, 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 a trailblazer in her own right. Sandy is the one who teaches me about Jovita Idar. And Charlotte Mangin, who is a French immigrant woman television producer, <clears throat> they together create Unladylike. And Unladylike is what introduces me to Jovita. Even though I went to Barnard College, which is a women's college, 
I studied women's studies, Latin American studies, and political economy, you would have thought that I would have been taught who Jovita Idar was, but never. And so, like you, when you first heard about Jovita Idar, I fell in love with her. I was like, oh my God, ¿qué es esto? And I'm not going to do it now, but I'll do it at the end maybe, because I wrap my hair up to go to sleep because, you know, Latinas and our hair. Um, so when I wrap my hair up in a bun here, and I never go outside like that, but, but I'm like, es que me parezco a Jovita. <laughs> o me quiero parecer a Jovita. You know, I'm just like, yeah, I'm feeling you. <laughs> now, the way I learned about my, what, what has kept me going as a journalist is actually an essential moment, and maybe some of you will read this work. It's written by a great Latino journalist. His name is Juan Gonzalez. Uh, if you don't listen to Democracy Now!, you should be listening to Democracy Now!, he's a co-host there, and uh, a former young lord, so a revolutionary in his own might, in his own right. And Juan Gonzalez wrote a book this thick called News for All the People, the untold story of journalists of color and our role in American history, or something to that effect. And it was in the reading of that book that I understood that me, as a Mexicana, who is now an American citizen, we'll talk about that in a second, that I had a connection to the profound roots of independent um, truth-telling journalists of conscience in this country. And it was through that book, News for All the People, that I was like, oh, my founding father is Frederick Douglass, a man born enslaved who then becomes finds freedom and gets his freedom, and then is the first editor-in-chief of a black newspaper called The North Star. He is, when I read about him, I'm like, and, and I live in Harlem in New York City, another black community, and so there is a, a statue of Frederick Douglass four blocks from my house. And then growing up in Chicago, <clears throat> on the south side, I learned about Ida B. Wells who was an investigative journalist, also born into slavery in Mississippi, and then spends her time in Chicago as an investigative journalist. And what she was reporting about was the lynchings that were happening. And what she was told by white journalists in the mainstream, they would say, you know, Ida, why do you have to be such a radical, un-American? Why do you have to be re reporting about lynchings? A lynching is not news. That's what they said. And Ida B. Wells died in poverty after being told by white journalists that she had a political agenda. So for me, it was Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells that I understood were like my godmother and my godfather of journalism. And then I discover Jovita. And so now I not only have Ida and Frederick, I have Mi Angelita Jovita. I like that. Tengo a Mi Angelita Jovita. Yeah, it's good. You can applaud. Um, and the thing is, you know, a lot of people, you know, the Instagram life, it just looks all fabulous on Instagram. And so people think that, you know, the fame, whatever that is, Literally, fame and a quarter will get you nothing, although a quarter with Jovita Idar's face could get you some. <laughs> but the truth is, is that as an independent investigative journalist who is fiercely critical and fiercely independent um, and who is also tiny, I was like, tiny but mighty, and I'm like, pero soy chaparra, so chaparra but mighty, but I also understand my privilege, as we were talking about our privilege. But the truth is, is that this work is hard. It's lonely. It's scary. Um, it's traumatic. There is light, but there's a lot of darkness. And you know, Jovita knew that light and she knew that darkness. 
But there's this thing about Jovita that we all feel, which is she had this duty, this total sense of duty, civic duty. And so for me, you know, Jovita was born on this side. I was born in Mexico. So um, I became an American citizen by choice. And, and at that point, um, everything changed for me because as a citizen, I understood that now I really did have eh, los papeles <laughs> to demand, right? To demand of this country, to demand and make demands on democracy and to criticize this country, just like Frederick Douglass said, those of us who love this country the most have the most capacity to criticize. And so what was important for me was in the process of democracy because at the core, Jovita and I and you, we are democracy. Well, I call myself a democracy junkie. I know that's a little bit weird, but it's, it's like it's this profound relationship to democracy. And why, right? I wasn't a citizen. I was growing up on the south side of Chicago in the middle of the civil rights era. Y mi mamá, que tampoco era ciudadana, all of us born in Mexico, it was my mom who taught me about democracy in multiple forms by taking me to a protest in the civil rights era in the 1960s, teaching me about democracy, teaching me just like Jovita has taught us, just like Rosie Castro has taught so many of us. I'll bring her up again. Committed to American democracy, to the project of American democracy. So you see the trend here, right? That, that there is an arc of Latinas, Mexicanas, Mexicano-Americanas, right? Who are in this arc of American history que estamos comprometidas, right? So yeah, I grew up like, well, I think like you, seeing Las Adelitas with the bandoliers. I saw the band, I saw the Adelitas. I needed to see more Jovitas in my life too. Because though I too became a revolutionary, I was like, ah, pues soy mexicana, soy radical, soy feminista, soy revolucionaria. But also, what would have happened if I had seen Jovita's image when I was in high school, walking by the high school newspaper and seeing it filled with guys and just being like, that's not the place for me. What would have happened if I had known about Jodita running her newspaper and, and defending it with her tiny but mighty little body? By the way, if you follow me on Instagram, you know I'm a boxer. Um, and, and that the physicalness, right, that the need to be physically attempting to be imposing when you're five feet tall, of course, because you know I'm wearing the six inch heels. Um, and so there is a through line that continues for me from El Paso where my life has changed on multiple occasions as well, being there right after the massacre, to San Antonio and also to Uvalde, which is a quarter's throw from where we are. So why, you're like, why is she talking about Uvalde? There's a connection, right? Why did I have, to, why when the horror happened did I feel like I have to go to Uvalde and do an investigation and understand it was why? Because once I understood the history of South Texas writ large, the history de un pueblo dándose a respetar. How do you say that in English? demanding respect, but there's a way when you say it in Spanish, dándose a respetar, which is something really beautiful, right? And so there is a through line, right, of what was happening in Uvalde, in Crystal City, in the 1970s, right, where there is this, this love of American democracy where we, you felt, con el derecho to make these demands by walking out of Robb Elementary in the 1970s, and Robb all the schools in, the in 1970 in Uvalde. One of the longest student walkouts in American history 
that no one knows about. And then going to Uvalde and being there with our esteemed Monica Munoz Martinez's mom, um, who told us, <clears throat> who told us about <clears throat> the teachers who heard her speaking Spanish when she was six years old and they would go and on the desk they, desk they had a votive, an empty votive candle with the image of La Virgen de Guadalupe filled with water and inside was a 16 inch or 18 inch ruler and when they heard her speak Spanish, they took the ruler out of the water and slapped the back of her calf and in her 70s as she's telling this story, she is crying and that propelled La, el, El Pueblo de Uvalde to walk out. And then there's trauma and violence because we live in the United States of America. But somehow, somehow there is the trajectory to a little girl named Caitlin Gonzalez who becomes, because of the trauma, the way she in reinterprets that is by owning her power of her voice. There is a continuum of Jovita Idar and her spirit that was present not only in El Paso, not only in San Antonio, but also in Crystal City and Uvalde, which are part of American history because they are the place where the modern Chicano movement of Texas was born. And that is not just Texas history, that is American history. Your part of the world changed the rest of the country just like Jovita did to the point where Caitlin, I was gonna bring it but then I was like, mm, but you know Caitlin Gonzalez at 11 years old, one year later on the one year anniversary of Uvalde ends up on the front page above the fold on the New York Times and so she's as I said to Caitlin's mom, Gladys, today, I was like, I realize she's no longer my Caitlin. She is the world's Caitlin Gonzalez. And yet what connected me to Caitlin, and you can watch this all in the Frontline documentary and on our documentary of Uvalde on Latino USA, was actually not our Latinidad or our Mexicanidad, it was actually our trauma. Caitlin from May 24th, and me from September 11th. And somehow that decades apart, different generations, it is a trauma that actually brings us together. And you know what? Jovita too had trauma. And yet how she worked it out, who, bueno, we know. She was just busy. She was busy, busy, busy. But one of the things that we know is that even though Jovita is receiving this extraordinary honor and in this moment in history, and even though you know the power of Latinos and Latinas, the second largest voting cohort in the United States, even though you know that Latinas are the most powerful consumers in the United States, still we are seeing apartados, less than takers, people who call us illegal. And you know there is no such thing as an illegal human being. Illegal is not a noun. If you've ever used that term, borralo de tu palabra, borralo de tu boca. And you know what? Jovita too was fighting against that kind of racism. And she was doing it in a place, yes, in El Paso, yes, here. Pero en El Paso, if you remember what was happening at the turn of the century, right around this time, was that there was a eugenics movement that was saying, what about Mexicanos? You put the two words together and it's a slur. That we were dirty. You put that next to Mexican, it's a slur. And so what happened in El Paso right around this time, a century ago, is that the idea was to make sure the Mexicans were not dirty checking our bodies, spraying our clothes with Sycon glass, with Sycon gas. ¿Qué importa eso? Because the law on the books 
to search our bodies as we came into the United States to make sure that we were clean was on the books until 1964. I arrived in this country in 1962 with privilege, a green card, with my brothers and sister. And because it was the law to check our bodies, the immigration agent checked my body as a baby and told my mom at the Dallas airport, well, it's okay, ma'am. You and the other kids can go on up to Chicago. We're just gonna take that little baby girl and we're gonna keep her here. We're gonna put her in quarantine, but you can go on up to Chicago. Y mi mamá, que no tenía nada, menos el trauma en ese momento, right? The only thing my mom had, in fact, was her voice. And she screamed at that immigration agent, and he got so scared from this little chaparrita screaming and making a scene. Sounds familiar. Sounds like Jovita standing in front of her newspaper, aquí no cruzan, using her voice and her arms. Mi mamá usando her voice, right? Jovita taught us how. Jovita taught us how to ser dueñas de nosotras mismas. How do you say that in English? To be owners of our true selves, of our proper selves. To be chingonas. She taught us how, although I'm sure her father, like mine, would not be happy to see their daughter wearing a block necklace that says chingona. <laughs> Con mucho respeto, papi. Te quiero mucho, pero sí, lo soy orgullosamente. Y sabes que Jovita was, con todo respeto a todos sus familiares, who, by the way, I love you. Thank you for having me here. She taught us how. She taught us because she learned de su bisabuela, su abuela, su mamá, su tía, sus primas. They all teach us how. They taught us how to be dueñas de nosotras mismas, to be dueñas of our own voices. And because of that, now in my darkest moments, it's not just Frederick, it's not just Ida, it's Jovita. And I talk to Jovita and I ask her, dame luz. So it, you know, I'm not, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. So I'm like, Don Ancin, Virgen de Guadalupe, Jovita, guide me. How do I do this? And you know what? Me guían. And I listen to her, like all of you. You have Jovita with you. Inside of us, Jovita vive. Jovita y dar vive. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Congratulations to Jovita Idar. Muchas, muchas gracias. Okay. Thank you, Miss Ina Oza. At this time, I'd like to invite one of Jovita Idar's great nieces, Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Lopez, to join me at the podium. Reverend Lopez, on behalf of the United States Mint, I'm pleased to present two American Women Quarters, one from each of our production facilities in Philadelphia and Denver, to the Dar family. Thank you for your continued efforts in preserving and honoring Hobita Adar's memory. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now I would like to invite Dr. Taylor Amy, president of the University of Texas at San Antonio to join me at the podium. Okay, President Amy, on behalf of the United States Mint, I would like to present you with a shadow box 
with two quarters, one from each of our production facilities at Philadelphia and Denver. Um, thank you for everything you've done to celebrate this evening and the life and legacy of Hovita Duck. Okay, so I'm also excited to share that we brought a little something for all of you also. Um, yeah. As you exit the event today, um, you will receive a commemorative coin board to collect all five of the American Women Quarters for 2023. And we've gotten you started with your very own Hovida Adar coin. <laughs> Okay, we're nearly at the end of today's ceremony, but there's one more thing we'd like to do today, and that's a coin pour. We brought 2,000 Hovita Adar coins quarters with us that will be poured into this beautiful display that you see on stage here. I'd like to invite Reverend Lopez, Dr. Amy, over to the table, along with Miss Inahosa, and last but not least, Jennifer Herrera, who's the Vice President of External Affairs for the National Women's History Museum. And I also, I'd also like to thank our partners at the National Women's History Museum for co-hosting this event and for all of your involvement in the American Women Quarters Program. All of you who have helped honor Hovita Dar and her fierce advocacy for the rights of Mexican Americans. It's with great pleasure that we present to you the new Ovita Adar Quarter. You know, tonight has been a very, very special occasion to be able to celebrate Jovita and all that she represents for hope and the future and advocacy for doing things that are right. We are just really honored here at UTSA to have had the opportunity to host the event this evening. So thank you all very much for being here. This brings us to the end of our program. I now invite you all to enjoy a closing performance by UTSA's Mariachis Los Paisanos and Ballet Folklorico. Please enjoy this final part of the event this evening. Thank you for being here. We love you.
Okay. 